Welcome to the River Online Sermon. Thank you for joining with me today. Let me pray for our time together as we get started. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this time. I pray that you would guide and direct this message, that you'd be glorified in this opportunity to dig into your word, that your name would be praised, that you would help us to receive from this what you want us to receive. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So the main class that I teach at Crown College is, is one that is entitled Gospel and Culture. And one of the books that we spend a lot of time on, well, not that much time, I guess, but one of the books that we read is called The 3D Gospel. And this book talks about how missiologists have identified three different worldviews um, that are based upon how different cultures relate to or respond to the idea of sin. Now, those three worldviews overlap, but over time, a particular culture um, uh, not over time, often time, a particular culture will identify mostly with one of those three worldviews. Um, Those three worldviews are guilt and innocence, which is most common in individualistic societies like much of the West, shame and honor, which is um, more common in collectivistic societies like we see in the East, and fear and power, which is more the animistic um, kind of communities that are common to tribal contexts. So here in our Western society, uh, we are part of the um, guilt-innocence worldview, and we can see that clearly in the the way that we tend to approach the gospel. The emphasis is typically on the ideas of individuals being guilty because of our sin and and how our guilt can be forgiven and how we can be declared innocent or uh, um, rendered innocent through the, the work of Christ. And Other cultures, when dealing with the problem of sin, focus more on how our sin brings shame, not only on us, but on our family or community, and how that shame needs to be dealt with so that our honor can be restored and uh, our relationship with God can be reconciled, um, or how our sin enslaves us to sin's curse and the dominion of darkness with the fear of death and how that has been overcome through the victory of Christ, which brings us into the kingdom of light. And In my class, we talk about how our natural tendency is to focus on that guilt and innocence model of the gospel and leave out the other aspects that some cultures around the world resonate with at a different level. Well, today, I want us to recognize that tendency as we look at our passage. And so please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Galatians chapter 3. So today we continue in our sermon series looking at Christ from outside of the gospels with a look at a letter from the Apostle Paul to the church in Galatia. Now, my plan was to focus on Galatians 4, verses 1 to 7, but um, and and I was going to use the end of of chapter 3 to give us a little bit of background and context for what we see in chapter 4. But in doing so, I found that instead of using those verses at the end of chapter 3 as context, I think we simply need to start at the end of chapter 3. Um, So Paul spends the first part of chapter 3 talking about how we are not saved by observing the law, but by faith. And he uses the example of Abraham's righteousness being based on his belief. He then moves on to talk about the law with some really strong words like curse and prison, while pointing out that the purpose of the law was not to bring life, but rather to bring about the recognition of sin and man's need for a savior. With that context in mind, let's pick things up in chapter 3 with verse 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, in prison until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. So what do you think of verse 23 and the idea that before faith, we were held captive under the law? Well, this provides an image of man being held in custody, with the law like a prison guard, confining us until Christ comes to set us free. It's a harsh picture that goes along with what Paul had been saying throughout the chapter, referring to the law with these strong, confining words. Here, Paul is comparing that with faith. Now, this is not saying that faith didn't exist before Christ came. Paul has just finished talking about how Abraham was justified by his faith. So that doesn't work, right? Well, throughout the Old Testament, we see men and women of faith who are obeying God because of their faith in him, right? Even the sacrificial atonement system was based on the idea of faith. But the Old Covenant was lived out with this system of rules and laws that dictated how people were to live and how they were to approach God and to deal with their sin. And that system served in that constricting role until the arrival of Christ. Now notice in verse 24, Paul uses the word guardian. It is actually the word pedagogue, which maybe some of you in the educational field might be familiar with. Sometimes the word is translated as a custodian or a disciplinarian. It's a word that refers to someone 
often in this time, uh, it would have been a slave, um, who had responsibilities to look after a child or to attend to them or maybe babysit them, even taking them back and forth to school, basically like a supervisor who was responsible for the child until they came to maturity. So how might that image of what the, uh, uh, be an example of what the law was like? Well, a guardian would provide boundaries for the child to keep the child safe and on the right path. Not so much teaching the child or nurturing the child or loving the child as much as providing structure. Likewise, throughout the Old Testament, we see the law providing the guidelines for how the followers of God were to live. It was like the rules that defined the covenant relationship they had with God um, served as a, a guardian to keep them in line. Now we can understand the reason uh, for some of the wording that Paul used then, right? The confining ideas. But he's pointing out also how that system was temporary. When Christ showed up, he brought the opportunity then for man to be justified by faith. So let's break that down. What does it mean to be justified? Well, this term fits really well within our guilt-innocence worldview. It's actually a legal term. that refers to being rendered or declared innocent, acquitted of charges, um, or declared righteous. And so then what does it mean then to be justified by faith? Well, Paul is saying that this declaration of righteousness is based not on our works or on us perfectly obeying the law, but rather based on faith. Again, Paul is talking about this um, throughout chapter 3 and, and has referenced how Abraham was declared righteous because of his belief or faith rather than his works. And Paul talks about this in other places as well, like in Romans 3 with the idea that all of us are sinners and there is a righteousness that is available apart from the law and we can be justified freely through the redemption that is available in Christ Jesus. So Paul is saying that the law was like this guardian that provided structure uh, for how man was to follow God and it supervised them for a time, but it also displayed their inability to follow it. And the people were under the law, but now through Christ, there is this justification that is available by faith. Now, like I talked about earlier, because we live in a guilt and innocence culture, this kind of language resonates with us really well. Christ came and dealt with our sins so that we could be declared righteous, even though we have not perfectly obeyed the law. That is good for us to recognize, but there's more to what Christ did that might not resonate with us as quickly. So let's take a look at verses 25 and 26. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. So what is Paul saying here? Well, if being under the law was like being under a guardian or a prison guard who confined us or supervised us through Christ in faith, we are now sons and daughters of God. You can see the difference, right? It's a completely different picture. Like we talked about earlier, the law was like a guardian providing structure, confining people to rules that governed how they were to follow God. But in Christ, through faith, rather than being children under a guardian, we are sons and daughters of God. Through Christ, our sin is dealt with, and we are brought back into a reconciled, renewed relationship with our Father in heaven. And this relationship is not like the relationship of a supervisor to a kid or like a prison guard to a prisoner. It is like a father to his child, where we have this relationship that has been restored and an identity as part of this family and a future inheritance that is secure. I love that. Paul continues to talk about this, so let's pick things up with verse 27. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, or Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all, in, all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. So what does it mean to be baptized into Christ and to put on Christ? Well, this is signifying the identification we have with God through faith in Christ. Baptism is an outward sign of what is going on inside, right? It's not the act of baptism that saves us, but Paul is talking about those who have responded to the gospel and received the salvation that is available through Christ. He then goes on to point out that this is available to everyone. He makes that very clear in verse 28. It doesn't matter who we are. He tears down ethnic and socioeconomic and gender differences and says none of it matters. This is available to everyone, and when we come to Christ, our identity is with him as sons and daughters who are all part of one big family. And the end of verse 28 suggests a unity that should govern what that looks like. This is not to say that our differences cease to exist, but rather that we recognize the unity we have in Christ, and that regardless of our differences, we are his children. Think about it for a moment. 
maybe a little bit harder for us to resonate with this because of our cultural context, but in the time that this was written, it was writing to Jews and Gentiles who ethnic differences provided a very strong divide that was very difficult to overcome. And slaves were looked at down upon by those who were free. And women at the time did not have the same rights or opportunities and often were either disregarded or belittled by men. Unfortunately, that still happens today as well, but in the context that Paul was writing, it would have been even more prevalent. This is saying that in Christ, those distinctions no longer divide. I mean, imagine the early church with Jews and Greeks, slave and free, men and women, worshiping together in unity as equals, sons and daughters of God. What a beautiful image. Paul is saying that, that it is not about our birthright or our heritage or what society says or anything else. It is not a designation that can be earned even the, through how good we are or how good we appear to be by, at observing the law. It is something that is given to us through Christ by faith. We then become offspring of Abraham, children of faith, children of the promise. By the way, I want to point out that this is not just Paul encouraging us to accept one another like this. He is stating that this is the reality. Not that he wants us to treat one another this way, but literally that this is who we are. We are sons and daughters of Christ, one in him. And if we are not living that out, then that's a problem. So with all that in mind, let's move on to chapter 4, because Paul continues this theme into the next chapter, picking these up with verse 1. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. So what's an heir? Well, an heir is someone who inherits something. And these verses are speaking specifically about when the heir is still a minor. That word translated there as child is not really focusing on the idea of a child like our earlier verses that we talked about, but more on the idea of a minor who has not yet reached maturity. Both the Jewish and Roman customs of this time would have included specific understandings of when a child would become an adult. They even had celebrations that acknowledged those events. And these verses are specifically dealing with the idea of an heir who is still a minor. And then the word translated as guardian here is not the same word that we translated back in verses 24 and 25. This is a word that is speaking more of like a trustee. From the perspective of inheritance, even today, a minor who is an heir would not fully receive the inheritance or have rights to make their own decisions or the freedom to use the inheritance as they saw fit until they reached a particular age of maturity. Until that time, even what they received would be supervised by a guardian or a trustee temporarily until some agreed upon time when the minor would be considered ready. With that in mind, let's pick things up with verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. So what does the beginning of verse 4 mean by the phrase, when the fullness of time had come? Well, this connects with the previous idea of the heir being a minor and under a guardian or trustee for a time that was to come. And here we see the idea that the time had arrived. A lot of people read into statements like this to say that God was waiting for a particular time in history to send Jesus. They even refer to how things like the Pax Romana or Roman peace allowed for a perfect expansion of the kingdom uh, with the gospel more easily t taken to other areas in a way that would not have been po as possible before this time. And so it's like God waited for that time. Well, that may be true, but I think that regardless of what was happening in the history of the world, that phrase simply suggests that for whatever reason, this was God's chosen time for Christ to come. Not like he had to wait, but this is when he chose for that. Now, what initially drew me to this passage was these four verses. Remember, we're looking at Christ from outside the Gospels. And here we see some slightly different wording that talks about why Christ came. Like we talked about in our guilt-innocence worldview model, we tend to focus on how Christ came to deal with our sin by dying on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin and bring forgiveness and justification for us. All of that is good and right, but these verses emphasize a slightly different side of the gospel. Notice what Paul chooses to emphasize about Jesus. Born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. Let's break those phrases down a bit. Why does he mention born of a woman? What's well, a good question. Some might say it's a reference to the virgin birth, but it doesn't mention anything about a virgin, just woman. 
it seems like Paul is focusing on Christ's humanity, that he was born of a woman just like the rest of us. He identified with you and me. Now, why did Paul point out that he was born under the law? Well, again, I think this emphasizes the fullness of Christ becoming human. I think it shows his total identification with man. Christ came to earth, placing himself under the law, and yet he did what no human being has ever done or could ever do. He perfectly kept the law, fulfilling it before dying on the cross as a perfect spotless sacrifice for the sins of mankind. Uh, those of us who have not kept the law perfectly. Which leads to the last point. He did so to redeem those under the law. So what does the word redeem or redemption mean? Well, that's a word that means to buy back or to purchase and carries with it specific connections to being bought out of slavery. Through Christ coming to earth as a human, submitting himself to the law, perfectly keeping it, and dying on a cross, he purchased our freedom, buying us out of slavery to sin and setting us free, which then dealt with that problem of sin, making it possible for us to be reconciled to God, and as we see here, so that we could receive adoption as sons. So what is adoption? Well, that means to be brought into a family, given the rights and privileges associated with a son or daughter, to be made an heir. It suggests the idea of belonging and identity and family. And then Paul ends by then describing a little bit of the benefits of what that means. So what do you think of verse 6? Well, I love this verse. It's so beautiful that because of this reality, through what Christ has done, we now can call out to God, the creator of the universe, with the words, Abba, Father. That is the intimate Aramaic wording that Jesus used in praying to his Father. And as Christians, we now, as sons and daughters, can come to God in the same way that Jesus did. There's also this beautiful image of the Trinity in this verse. We see that because of what God the Son has done for us, we as believers are given God the Holy Spirit to live within us. And through him, we're able to call out to God our Heavenly Father in heaven in this intimate expression as our Daddy, because we are adopted children in his family. I love that image. So Paul ends by affirming that idea once more. We are no longer slaves, but adopted children. And because of that, we are heirs. Which brings us back to that image from the beginning of chapter 4 with those minors who did not yet have the rights and privileges, but this is saying now we are full heirs, able to experience all of the rights and privileges that go along with that. So in closing, as I talked about at the beginning, our natural tendency is to notice and emphasize the guilt and innocence concept of the gospel. But in these verses, while we see those things, there's also this beautiful realization of what that means. That through Christ, we are adopted as sons and daughters, brought into this family, given the rights of an heir. That's something I think we sometimes gloss over as we focus on the elimination of our sin and guilt. But I love this image of a child who was a slave being purchased out of slavery and adopted into this family, given a place of honor and the rights and privileges of sonship, with a renewed relationship with a daddy, and made an heir whose inheritance is secure. I don't know where you are today, but I want to leave you with that image of who we are in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for that. I thank you for the amazing gift that you have given to us in dealing with our sin and making it possible for us to be reconciled with you, you have brought us into your family, adopted us as sons and daughters, making us heirs, giving us a place and a home and a people, being made into this beautiful family. We thank you for that. May our hearts resonate with the reality of who we are in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.